Hello, everybody. My name is Jakob Hallgren. I am the Swedish ambassador to the Republic of Korea. I would like to welcome you all to Democracy in the Times of Corona. This event is co-hosted by the Embassy of Sweden in Seoul and International IDEA, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance. I'm so incredibly glad that we could organize this important and I think very timely discussion. And it, take place, it takes place both virtually uh, with global participation, quite a few countries, and also live with an exclusive audience here at the Swedish residence in, in Seoul. While we're only some 10 people here at the Swedish residence respecting social distancing, we're almost 500 people joining, so it's really great to, to have you. So today uh, we're going to look into issues of how democracy is coping with the existential challenge of COVID-19. And this with three prominent democracies are in the spotlight. It's Australia, it's the Republic of Korea, and it's Sweden. So we will look at how this pandemic has affected elections, institutions, trust in, in, in government, uh, uh, among other things. And a key reason uh, for us to organize this event today is the Swedish government's drive for democracy. And it's a, that is a policy that stems from the conviction that we all have a duty to raise awareness of the fact that democracy is actually in decline in the world today. And that we also have to mobilize all the support and good forces for the fundamental principles of, of democracy. Now, I hope that today's discussion will both make us wiser and maybe give us hope uh, and some good ideas of how to expand, uh, defend and expand democracy and democratic values. And we have an amazing program today. First, we're honored to have a, a first high-level panel with no less than three foreign ministers. The foreign ministers of Australia, the Republic of Korea and Sweden, and with that, the Secretary General of International IDEA. That's quite amazing, I think. And after that first panel, we're going to have a short break. And as a second part of today's event, and I really encourage you to stay for that, we will have a fascinating expert panel with three professors and an eminent expert from International IDEA. And during this latter session, you will all, both you here at the, in the live audience and all you out there, will be able to put questions. I really encourage you to start to think of questions that you can send in to us online. Now, I will soon give the floor uh, to Dr. Kevin Casasamora, who is the Secretary General of International IDEA and who will be our moderator for this high-level session. Dr. Casa Samora has more than 25 years experience in democratic governance as a researcher, as an educator, and also as a public official. And I think he embodies a rare combination of a distinguished academic career, strongly focused on electoral systems and democratic institutions, with also practical experience as a high-level public official in his native Costa Rica, but also in international organizations. So with this and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Casa Zamora. Please. Ambassador Holgren, uh, and to the Swedish embassy in Seoul for co-organizing this event uh, alongside International IDEA. Uh, in record time, uh, I should say. And this is a part of, the, uh, of Sweden's drive for democracy, which is a key priority of the Swedish government, one which we at IDEA enthusiastically support. For those of you who are not so familiar with International IDEA, we are an intergovernmental organization with 33 member states with the exclusive mandate to support and strengthen democratic institutions and processes around the world. Our work has a dual nature. On the one hand, we produce cutting edge, comparative and policy friendly knowledge of matters related to electoral processes, political parties and representation, constitutional 
uh, processes, and, and democratic governance writ large. And on the other hand, we help to apply this knowledge on the ground through technical assistance aimed at policymakers, civil society groups, institutions, public authorities at the, uh, at the national and local levels. This year, we happen to be celebrating our 25th anniversary. And for that reason as well, we are particularly glad uh, to co-organize this event uh, together with one of our founding member states and our host country, Sweden, and to have another founding member state, Australia, taking part in this, in this event. We're truly grateful to both of you for the support uh, that your countries have provided international idea for the past <laughs> five years. But we're also very honored to have the foreign minister of the Republic of Korea joining us today, uh, especially through our Asia Pacific regional program. We have been very grateful for the, for the different collaboration opportunities with the Republic of Korea and the ability to draw on the important dem democratic experience and expertise uh, of its institutions. Now, let me say a word about the topic uh, of, this, of this webinar. Uh, we have all witnessed in the past three months or so the, that the coronavirus pandemic uh, is drastically changing the world causing disruption of a magnitude probably not seen since the end of the Second World War. Aside from the global health crisis that uh, has caused uh, over 400,000 deaths already, the world most likely will be faced with a destabilizing, profound economic crisis, it already is, but also in our view, there will be profound political implications that stem from this pandemic. Until now, political leaders at all levels have been responding to this crisis with an unprecedented set of measures aimed to curb the spread of the virus, protect public health, and keep the economy afloat. Around the world, authoritarian regimes have started using the crisis to silence critics and tighten their political grip on power. But even some democratically elected governments are fighting the pandemic by amassing emergency powers that in many cases restrict fundamental rights. While the use of extraordinary measures and emergency powers can be justified a to address the current health crisis, some measures, such as silencing critical media and arresting journalists, harassing civil society groups, or using minorities as scapegoats, are much harder to justify from the democratic standpoint. In the upcoming discussion, we're going to deliberate on what the current corona pandemic means for democracy and for democracy support in general, but we'll do so through the lens of the cases of Australia, the Republic of Korea, and Sweden. <coughs> As per the International Idea Global State of Democracy Report of 2019, which is one of our flagship products, all three, Australia, the Republic of Korea, and Sweden are among the highest performing democracies in the world. But their strategies and responses to the pandemic have varied, revealing the nuances and the importance of a national contents. So we hope that the discussion will reveal some interesting insights on, first, how democracies can balance mitigation of the outbreak while still respecting democratic principles such as accountability and transparency and full respect for civil and political rights. Second, uh, we expect the discussion to highlight the importance of robust institutions, 
of levels of societal trust and access to information when dealing with a pandemic without undermining democracy. And, and therefore, I think the lessons learned from the, from the experience of Australia, the Republic of Korea and Sweden are very germane to this discussion. And number three, I certainly hope the discussion will shed light on the medium and longer term implications of COVID-19 for democracy. So these are some of the, of the issues that our speakers will be dealing with today. Before we get to the questions and the dialogue that I, I, I hope to, to have with our very distinguished guest, I am very honored to welcome the, the three foreign affairs ministers uh, that will take the floor for all too short five minutes uh, to do some introductory remarks. And we'll start with Her Excellency Senator Marie Spain, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Australia. Senator Payne has been uh, a senator for the state of New South Wales in her native country for more than 20 years and has served most recently as Minister for Defense between 2015 and 2018. But before that, uh, she was a Minister for Human Services and she held several shadow uh, ministry level positions. So without further delay, Senator, Minister Payne, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, and good evening from, uh, from Australia. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. And it's very good to see my counterparts again, uh, Anna and uh, Kungwa. Wonderful to uh, to join you virtually uh, again. We have been taking the opportunity in these times of COVID nineteen to uh, to catch up uh, virtually uh, in some very valuable exchanges. Uh, Secretary General, can I thank you uh, and International Idea for hosting this webinar uh, with uh, His Excellency the Ambassador of Sweden uh, to the Republic of Korea. I think our discussion uh, today provides a good platform for democracies like ours to reiterate the importance of key values and principles of transparency, of accountability, the rule of law, the international rules-based order and human rights. Importantly, we can't afford to let COVID-19 distract us from the need to both protect and promote these principles and to call out instances where we see uh, them being undermined. Uh, these are core values and principles which guide Australia's engagement, particularly as a member of the UN Human Rights Council, as we do emerge from this crisis and look to recovery. Uh, to this end, we warmly welcomed the World Health Assembly's consensus on the need for an independent, impartial and comprehensive evaluation into uh, COVID-19. We called for such a review because as a democracy, we know that openness and transparency are essential to learning the lessons of the pandemic. And we look to countries like Sweden and Korea to work with us to improve global pandemic prevention and to build the capability of key multilateral agencies like the World Health Organization. So while democracies are dealing with the pandemic's impact, grappling with the challenges of recovery. We have seen some actors use this as an opportunity to undermine democracy and to promote a much more authoritarian agenda and the Secretary General made broad reference to uh, some of those. One in our own region here in the Indo-Pacific uh, is the decision by China's National People's Congress to pass new national security laws that will be imposed on Hong Kong. With a number of international counterparts, particularly from Britain, from Canada and from the United States, uh, we have expressed deep concern about this decision, which was taken, importantly, without the direct participation of the Hong Kong people. There is genuine concern that the legislation will undermine one country, two systems, that it will erode human rights and individual freedoms 
that have been guaranteed by the basic law and by the 1984 Sino-British Joint Declaration. Further, uh, we see the particular importance of online information during the pandemic, which has created space for disinformation. And that disinformation is literally, specifically, purposefully designed to sow order and distrust. And that has happened in multiple examples around the world. So we are all being tested. Australia will always support the right to peaceful protest. But even peaceful gatherings like the Black Lives Matter protests that took place in Australia around uh, in, across the last weekend in support of the global movement, even they are, as we see them, forcing societies and governments to make difficult decisions, decisions about the balance of respect for civil and political rights with the safety of communities indeed including the safety of protesters themselves and this is a matter of some discussion and debate uh, including here in australia at the moment but ultimately that's where democracies are able to show their strength their true strength with openness with accountability and with respect for individual human rights democratic systems uh, can encourage the confidence of their populations, even in the midst of a crisis. I wanted to cite uh, an example around gender equality as well as one example of a human right, which is a strong feature of liberal democracies, which empower women's leadership, which enhance their safety, their security and their economic opportunity. Gender equal policies enable us to lead to more prosperous and sustainable, sustainable societies without the disparities which are often common in authoritarian regimes. Many would say that democracies may sometimes look imperfect and they, like most things in life, are rarely 100% perfect. But with the airing of disagreements, with the admission of mistakes where they're made, they can be stronger for it because self-governed people ultimately have the trust in a common mission. That is being proven again through the COVID-19 crisis and hopefully will support our process as individually and together we work towards recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Payne. I'd now like to invite Her Excellency Kan Kyun Hwa Foreign Minister of the Republic of Korea. Dr. Kyun Hwa has been the Senior Advisor on Policy to the United Nations Secretary General and was previously the Deputy High Commissioner at the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And those are merely the highlights of a very long and distinguished uh, career in the diplomacy of her country. Uh, please, Minister, Doctor, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to join you for today's webinar. I'm really grateful to the Swedish ambassador here, Ambassador Halgren and the International IDA for hosting this very timely and important event. And I, it's wonderful to see my friends, Maurice and Anne, and the other friends from Australia and Sweden, and of course the other distinguished participants on, on an issue of such great importance at this critical time for the world. As you all say, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic has been overwhelming in all aspects of our lives and has exposed and deepened the existing social, economic and political fault lines in our own countries as well as in the international community. And some of the fundamental values that we are used to taking for granted, such as democracy and human rights, have been threatened and come under doubt. Indeed, in the early stages of the pandemic, there were questions over the effectiveness of democracies in the fight against this fast spreading virus, while some of the authoritarian governments seem to be successfully flattening the curve. And even in countries long committed to democratic values and human rights, concerns, concerns were raised and still continue about the use of digital technology in the efforts to contain COVID-19, turning into tools of mass surveillance and control, the detriment of 
fundamental human rights. Korea, as you know, was one of the first countries to be hit by a huge surge in COVID-19 cases. And by necessity, more than choice, it, we have been a few steps ahead in trying to curb the virus while also dealing with these and other tough questions. And for a while, as the surge kept climbing, it seemed as if it could spiral out of control. But thanks to the whole of government efforts and active engagement with citizens in massive testing, contact tracing and treatment, we managed to flatten the first big wave. And it was during this time of a plateauing curve in mid-April that we held our nationwide parliamentary elections on schedule. But alarmingly, uh, the curve has turned upwards again recently due to some cluster infections in the metropolitan Seoul area originating from nightclubs, logistics centers, religious facilities, and other places where large numbers of people gather in close proximity. Clearly, there is no room for complacency against this virus, which travels very fast and very silently because people without symptoms can be infectious. So we continue to adapt our measures to the changing pattern in the spread of the virus while sticking to our principles of full transparency and openness. I think in the previous session of this webinar, Dr. Casas identified three areas of concern for any democratic regime in this time of global crisis, namely freedom of movement, freedom of information and elections. And I'm very reassured to know that they are indeed the same elements that my government has worked hard to safeguard while fighting COVID-19. And indeed, I think it is safe to say that because we have preserved the three, our fight against COVID-19 has been effective and sustainable. On the freedom of movement, this has been the key pillar of our principle of openness. We have kept society open without a whole of wholesale lockdown or shutdown. We have sought balance between the virus containment measures and sustained economic and everyday life activities. Without closing the border, we have managed the inbound traffic of people, both Korean and foreign nationals, without discrimination, with measures that are proportionate to the changing risk of the virus coming in with the travelers. We were able to do this because of our robust testing and tracing re regime which quickly identifies positive cases and their close contacts so that they may be quarantined and the rest of society can freely move about. And without these, I think keeping society open and preserving the freedom of movement for the general public would have been much more difficult in one of the most densely populated countries in the world. On freedom of information, this has been served by the uncompromising transparency that has guided government action from the very beginning of the crisis, even when government measures were failing to meet public expectations. For example, over the issue of the facial mask supplies, I can't tell you for how long we have struggled with this issue until we got the formula right, but it took us nearly two months of much criticism from parliament, from the media, and uh, we almost felt we couldn't do anything, but we, we, we were patient. And in the end, with some help from the private sector, we were able to come to a solution. But full disclosure about what we know and don't know about the virus spread and government actions through the twice daily public briefings and Q and A's with the press has required much work. But this has also won the trust of the people that the government was doing our very best. We may not be satisfactory, but at least we were trying our very best. And this also prevented panic buying and other mass behaviors that can be fueled by distrust in government. And of course, the clearest confirmation of that trust was the highest voter turnout in nearly three decades for the April 15th elections. Furthermore, our disease control and prevention law stipulates the public's right to know about health risks that could affect them. And this has been fulfilled by public service alerts delivered to smartphones about the anonymized trajectories of positive cases. And I think the concern over the privacy of the patient is rather overblown 
because what is shared through the alerts is only the location and the time of the places along the trajectory of a patient without indicating his or her name, occupation, or address. And this public trust in government has translated into civic participation and cooperation in the stringent social distancing measures and other guidances advised by the government. It has also encouraged citizens to come up with creative solutions to complement the government actions. And indeed, our now famous drive-through testing was proposed by a young doctor. The distribution of the facial mass has been greatly facilitated by applications developed by private citizens. And there are such myriad of such applications and the government work has been then to scale up the useful solutions so that they can be made available countrywide. On elections, the IDA report on our nationwide elections of April 15th is very comprehensive, thorough, and I greatly appreciate it. And I do concur with the conclusion that our experience may not be applicable in other countries. But still, our National Election Commission has been organizing webinars and online symposiums with uh, election management authorities of various countries to share our experiences. And these have been very lively, productive, and I'm, I'm told very, very detailed. Every country context is unique and ours may not be the best practice to consider for many. We have a very advanced IT infrastructure, which has certainly been painful, but more than the IT, it has really been the human power in tracing. It has really been the ep ep epidemiological teams who investigate all the sites along the trajectory and interview the people around so as to identify the close contacts. And no amount of technology can replace the legwork and the human touch of these teams of professionals and trained volunteers. And I'm sure uh, for the April 15th elections too, there were lots of data platforms and digital technology mobilized in the run-up during and after the day. But what mattered most for the people to feel safe in coming to exercise their constitutional rights was the human face, the workers, the staff of the Central Election Commission and the countless volunteers who guided the voters through long queues, looked, took their fever checks, helped them to use hand sanitizers and put on disposable gloves outside the voting stations, checked their identities against the residency registry and handed out the voting slips, made sure their slips went into the ballot box and then escorted them to the exit. So in the end, I think technology is only as good or bad as how it is used. And we have certainly endeavored to use it widely, wisely with full accountability to the people. We are a government about serving the people. And I think the failures of the recent past make us particularly keen on this point. But in the end, this is the whole point of government, any government that is to serve the people and do our very best to keep them safe and secure. And I'm sure everybody can agree to that point. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister. Fascinating, fascinating remarks. Uh, last but not least, I'm pleased to invite Foreign Minister Anne Linde of Sweden. Minister Linde has had a long and distinguished career in public service in her country. Before she became Minister of Foreign Affairs, she was Minister for Foreign Trade, Minister for EU, uh, EU Affairs and Trade, and State Secretary at the Ministry of Justice. Please, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, uh, dear guests, friends. Um, let me first extend my thanks to International IDEA and the Swedish Embassy in Seoul for hosting this important uh, conversation on the implication of the COVID-19 response for democracy and the rule of law. I want to especially thank International IDEA and you, Secretary General Kevin Casasamora, for moderating this uh, webinar um, and the work you're doing in IDEA. And also my colleagues, uh, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne and Foreign Minister Kang kyung -wa. Uh, And I think it's fascinating how often we see each other and talk to each other in this pandemic, even though I long for some, some personal meetings again. But still, it, it's not only bad. 
Um, I look forward to, to this discussion today and I also want to thank those of you who take part via the internet. Uh, today's webinar is the latest in a series of democracy talks held at the Swedish missions around the world. The themes has ranged over a number of topics, violence against women during quarantine, women's and girls' mental health during the pandemic, media freedom, safety for journalists, and the protection of human rights defenders, among other themes. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the world faces a common difficulty. Different strategies to deal with the spread of the virus have emerged. In some countries, decisions have been taken to detriment of fundamental freedoms. We need these restrictions to end as soon as the pandemic allows it. To stop the spread of the virus effectively while staying true to democratic ideals can be a challenge. Every opportunity to learn from each other's experience is a welcome one. Fundamentally, we all share the same goal, to save life and protect public health. Sweden is dealing with the same challenges and we are using similar tools as most other countries promoting social distancing, protecting vulnerable risk groups, and reinforcing our health system to cope with the pandemic. In order to counter trends of backsliding democracy and weaken respect for human rights, our government is pursuing a global drive for democracy. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen that our drive for democracy is as relevant as ever. We receive reports of potential negative effects of measures to combat COVID-19 on civil society actors, human rights defenders, and media workers. Sweden is working hard to make sure that human rights, democracy, and the rule of law are put at the heart of the global response to the coronavirus in the short as well as in the long term. We have therefore gathered the United Nations, the EU, the OSCE and the Council of Europe to see how we can mobilize internationally. I've held meetings with both national and international uh, civil society actors about the effects of the corona on human rights. Sweden priorities include supporting and strengthening the civil society strengthen respect for freedom of expression and information, and reducing inequalities. We need to commit to creating and upholding the public trust in democratic systems and institutions. There are aspects to democracy which we need to uphold despite the pandemic, such as labor rights. It is crucial to ensure transparency and access to reliable information. The right to health not only depends on accessible health care, but also to the possibility of staying informed. We must also effectively counter disinformation, as there are those who are trying to make use of the pandemic to sow discord and weaken the public's trust in democratic institutions. Any emergency responses and restrictions in response to COVID-19 must be in full compliance with international law. This, of course, applies to my own country, Sweden, as it does to any other country. Now, during the crisis, as well as after, we must remain vigilant, because when we come out of this crisis, we must ensure that our standards has not shifted. In the aftermath of all this, we will face a battle of narratives revolving around which form of government countered the outbreak most effectively. In this, all of us have an important task in promoting the advantage of democracy and arguing for a democratic, human rights-based approach to countering COVID-19. We want to think together and consider how we can act together with multilateral actors, like-minded countries and civil society. This pandemic has made it clearer than ever that international cooperation is key to overcoming this crisis. 
I look forward to today's discussion on how COVID-19 affects our democratic institution and to hear more of your thoughts on how we can safeguard them moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Linde. Uh, a truly interesting set of remarks we have. And, and I would like, if you allow me to to ask a few questions, trying to zero in on the on some of the distinctive features of the response that each country has attempted in the face of COVID-19. And, and here, I would like to start with uh, Minister Payne. A, you know, one of the things that sets Australia apart in this panel is that it, it is a federal country. We're decision-making powers when it comes to COVID-19, including the lifting of restrictions, is shared between the federal government and subnational governments. How have the federal and state governments come together in, in the midst of this, of this crisis? How do you deal with the inevitable frictions that emerge in the course of that interaction? To, uh, to deal with the pandemic? Uh, it's a very good question. And uh, in the over 30 years that uh, I've spent in, uh, in and around politics uh, in Australia, I have never seen an approach uh, like the one that has been taken by my Prime Minister and by the uh, state and territory ministers. So to start with, it's worth understanding that uh, my Prime Minister uh, shares a uh, political background with a number of the state and territory chief ministers and premiers, but not all. Uh, mm. So uh, in bringing together uh, a group which has become known as the National Cabinet, so the Prime Minister and the Premier of every state and the Chief Minister of each territory, in bringing that together, it's a multi-party approach. Uh, and uh, Australia has a, a robust party democracy uh, split uh, split uh, very clearly uh, between uh, two major parties and then uh, a series of, of minor parties. So this is a very unusual endeavour. Um, typically, our states and territories run the service delivery entities, the schools, the hospitals, they employ the frontline health workers. Uh, so best to co the, in the best way to coordinate that, it was thought we should bring together this national cabinet. Uh, and it was highly successful and continues to be so. Uh, sometimes at the height of the pandemic in the last few months, it has met more than once a week, uh, dedicating hours and hours of leaders' time to that process. Uh, it's turned into a fortnightly meeting and uh, the tempo has, uh, has slowed slightly. Uh, but what is, I think, really important for this discussion uh, is that it has been so effective that the Prime Minister and the National Cabinet have determined to continue with this arrangement as a national arrangement beyond the, uh, the pandemic, uh, particularly as we take forward work on economic planning, on jobs uh, and on recovery. Uh, and in terms of points of friction, uh, as, uh, as has been raised, uh, one really significant issue is uh, the difference that uh, states and territories are making around the easing of restrictions in their, uh, in their social isolation requirements, their, um, uh, their social distancing. So the National Cabinet agreed on a three-step framework uh, and the plan is agreed, but each state and territory will make their own decisions based on their individual circumstances their local conditions as to timing of its implementation. So there are still internal uh, different approaches to, uh, to resolution and to timing, but the plan is agreed. So uh, it is unique uh, and uh, I've been very interested as a uh, long-term observer and practitioner of the uh, political process in Australia to see it play out. Thank you so much. It is fascinating, you know, how this enormous crisis is creating opportunities for democratic renewal, you know, and for for political actors to come together in more constructive ways. Um, now I would like to go to Minister Lind uh, in Sweden. Uh, as we know, uh, the Swedish approach 
it, to deal with the pandemic has attracted a lot of attention. And, and I can tell you that my, you know, even my friends in Costa Rica keep asking me about a, what Sweden is, is doing because uh, Sweden has not implemented the, the same strict uh, measures and shelter in place orders uh, that other countries have, have adopted. It, this quite clearly, at least to me living in Sweden, uh, one of the interesting things about this is that I have to say that it's a very, the, the defense that the government uh, has done this approach is a very articulate one. I mean, this is not something that was concocted out of thin air. There's a there's an underlying philosophy behind it. it. Can you, Minister, please explain us a little bit about the approach and the underlying philosophy? And can you tell us a little bit about how this approach is uh, is resulting in 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 uh, so far? Yes, thank you. Yes, there is a very high degree of interest in many countries, uh, and not the least because the President Trump now at least five times has referred to our strategy. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's nothing that is absolutely is not. So that, of course, creates a, a, a lot of, uh, of uh, questions. I had to, to answer New York Times this morning, for example, on, on herd immunity. And let me just state, we don't have a strategy of herd immunity in, in Sweden. Uh, actually, um, we have more or less the same goals as every uh, other country to, to have uh, the uh, uh, well-being of our citizens first and, and, and front, to try to flatten the curve to uh, not uh, get uh, too high um, pressure on our healthcare system, which has been also successful. We have all the time have between 20 and 30 percent capacity available on the uh, intensive uh, care places. Uh, we also try to, of course, uh, mit mitigate the, the effects on, on business and job. But the most important is, of course, to avoid uh, death and, uh, and the transmission of the virus. And here we can see that um, uh, it has been very regional uh, in Sweden. It is around the capital. And over 90% of the infected are uh, more than 70 years old and the middle um, age to, for, for the death is 82 years old. So what we have not succeeded in is to keep the virus out of the, health, uh, the elderly uh, care homes. And that is where we have not uh, been uh, successful. But uh, we differ on other countries roughly in two issues. One is that we have not shut down our child care center um, uh, schools for, for the younger uh, up till 16 years. And now you can see in many countries that uh, there is a discussion if it was actually necessary to close down schools where they have done so. Um, and we also have no regulation to force citizens to remain in their home. But the recommendation the authority is giving to stay home in the slightest of uh, symptoms, to keep social distancing and to uh, um, uh, wash their hand, it's followed to a very, very high degree. Still several months after, or more, more than 80% follow these recommendations very strictly. Um, and that is because our system that is different from other countries is since the 16th century where we have very small ministries and very big authorities and the authorities gives recommendations and that is understood that that is not kind of tip that you could follow if you want to it's you should follow those uh, recommendations because the public trust um, between interpersonal relation between authorities and people and between people um, and authorities, it goes all the ways, is very high. And that is due to also international service. It's not just something that we think. We, we know for sure that's in, in that, that way. So I think that um, <clears throat> there are 
uh, not that big difference. Uh, we believe uh, that it's good for the public health that people are outdoors. We believe that people should do the training, the promenades, everything. Um, but, uh, uh, and we have managed several parts of the strategy, but we have not managed to keep the transmission out of our uh, uh, elderly care. And since every death is a tragedy, this is, of course, something that we are very sorry about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Linde. Now I, will, I would like to, uh, to ask um, a Minister uh, Kyun Hwa in Korea about the elections. Um, it, it is, you know, by, by all accounts, the, the elections in Korea came out very well. I mean, they were, uh, I would say the word, uh, a stunning success. Uh, you mentioned in your remarks that uh, perhaps the, the ability of this experience to travel is is limited, but probably there are lessons for other countries. And I'm pretty sure that you've been asked uh, over the past few few weeks about what those lessons might be. And and one of the things I have to say that that I uh, in in analyzing the the Korean experience with the with the election, I was particularly impressed with. The, the prowess which, uh, with which the election management body communicated the options available to citizens and the measures that they were taking. Uh, I know from your background that you're an expert in communications. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the lessons that might be able to travel to other countries that emerge from the from the elections and and specifically comment on the issue of a communications as a very important part of this of this uh, uh, successful mm -hmm. strategy. To elections. Well, thank you very much, and and very happy to be part of uh, this discussion. Uh, but just um, in addition to what Marisa is saying about this whole of government approach, uh, this has also been very successful in our country as well. We are not federal, but our cities and, and provincial mayors are directly elected. The hospital resources, the education resources are under their management. So it has been extremely important to create a whole of government approach under the prime minister. And we have met every day, <laughs> in fact, uh, since it, was cre it went into action in late February and we continue to meet. The prime minister will no longer shares it every day, perhaps twice, a, twice a, a week, but it is still meeting every day. And that level at the highest level between the central government ministers and the local authorities to identify problems and blockages, find solutions, make sure that they are implemented has really been uh, what's driven uh, the whole of a government response. On the elections, uh, I think the communication bit is not something that was just for the election. It was, it was from the very beginning, as I have said, the transparency element, which is constantly providing information to the public. Um, and this, the twice daily briefings, once in the morning about this whole of government approach, what comes out of that, we brief the public. And then on the disease, uh, the center, the, the uh, the uh, director of our Center for Disease Control does a daily briefing every day at two on, on, the, on the evolving nature of this virus, what we know, what we don't. We still don't know a lot about this virus, which is why, uh, you know, even though we are, you know, looked at upon as having de dealt with this successfully in the first round, who knows who's going to be judged as a success and a failure in the longer term when this is all over and we say, okay, let's take a look and see where things are. So we're, we're not complacent. We're not out of the woods and we remain very, very vigilant. The communication part, uh, what I would like to say is that it has to be there on a daily basis, not just for the elections, because you need to have that trust 
for the public to look at what is being prepared, what is being uh, um, communicated in preparations for the election. So this, you know, the, the, the tr communication, the messaging and the, and the transparency element all go in together. And we work very hard on the messaging, the message that needs to go out to the public. Of course, we also preserve that independence of the Electoral Commission. They are an independent body aside from the, any government interference or, or, as, or any legislative interference. So while preserving their independence, making the, uh, in, in, in providing all the information that was going into the preparations to the public has been uh, part of our work. There were never any time uh, that anybody entertained the idea that this might be postponed. I got some questions from foreign reporters, you know, is this election going to happen? And I, I say, absolutely, there's, there's, you know, this is a constitutional right that we are determined to um, preserve. Uh, and I think technically it was important also, as you say, to provide many opportunities for voters to vote, for the overseas voters, for patients in hospital, we made online uh, mail-in voting possible. For those quarantined, we established a separate procedure where they can come and, and exercise their right. So dispersing the voting public so that we can conduct this without people coming in a, in a crowded fashion to the, to the voting booth, I think it technically was an important move that we made and, and made available to the to the people. So yes, a lot of people turned out for the early voting days, two days uh, before the, uh, uh, I think a week or two before the actual date, uh, there were two days of early voting. You could walk into any, any uh, uh, pre-identified location in your neighbor and vote. You didn't necessarily have to go back to your district. On election day, yes, you needed to go to your election district. So um, by, by dispersing uh, the voter turnout uh, through a series of phased approaches, I think was technically a very wise one. And just announcing what voters needed to do on that day as they come to the, to the booth, uh, this was a constant messaging on a couple of our public uh, broadcasting, broadcasting channels. And I think by that time, I think because, you know, this was a time when we had now plateaued. It was clear that we were going into a downturn. Um, by that time, the government already had that trust from the public. And, and in addition to that, um, you know, no, may, being assured that uh, every step was being taken uh, so that the actual day, uh, all precautions were being taken for that actual day, uh, needed to, in fact, the greatest turnouts in, in three decades. And knock on wood, so far, no positive cases that can be traced to any activities during that day so far. Well, thank, thank you, you so very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Minister. Well, we've gone a, beyond the time that was allocated and uh, since our very distinguished guests are extraordinarily busy people, a, we won't keep them longer. Though there are so many interesting questions that emerge from this discussion. I mean, questions about a, what we can learn from this crisis, you know, and I guess the, the next panel will illuminate, a, will shed light on some of those questions. Questions about the, uh, what to do about the economic crisis that is uh, upon us, a, questions about the geopolitical implications. We could go on all day. Uh, for the time being, I want to uh, to thank you in a very sincere way for for making the time for this uh, conversation. You know, I think uh, we are all in this together. There's a lot of perplexity uh, about how to cope with this. And uh, this kind of discussion, uh, bringing together very practical examples from democracies that have successfully dealt in their own way with the pandemic, I think helps us all. So I, I want to thank you, uh, Minister Payne, um, Minister Linde, 
and 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 Minister Quan Hua uh, for uh, your generosity and your and your clarity. And with this, uh, I yield the floor or I give it back to Ambassador Holgren. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you so much. And I really agree with Dr. Casa Samora. And thank you to the three foreign ministers for thank this you. amazing discussion. Uh, so we will now break uh, a couple of minutes, but please stay tuned because we will come back to this expert panel in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. So thank you so much and look, see, look, looking forward to see you soon. Please stay tuned. Thank you. So hello everybody and welcome back to the second session of Democracy in the Times of Corona. My name is Jakob Hallgren, I'm the Swedish Ambassador to the Republic of Korea and I am really proud to moderate this session that we are co-hosting with International IDEA and where I work, which is the Embassy of Sweden in, in Seoul. I think we've just listened to an outright fascinating discussion among the three foreign ministers of Australia, the Republic of Korea and Sweden, moderated by the ably moderated, I would say, by the Secretary General of International I IDEA. And now we're turning to what I said at the beginning, a, a just eminent panel of professors and experts to drill a little further into the issues that, we, that were brought up in the, in the first session. And I urge all of you, both the people here at the, at the residence, the Swedish residents here in Seoul, we have a, a small but exclusive crowd respecting social distance, and all of you who are out there to keep uh, sending in your questions. We have received quite a few questions, and we're actually up to about 500 people following this live now in real time, which is, I think, quite amazing. There is a form that you can use where you can put, uh, write your, your questions on the, on the live stream page. So I look forward to hearing more from uh, these real experts that I have here in the, in the panel on how democracies and institutions are coping with the COVID-19 outbreak, both the risks but maybe also the opportunities. Will it actually result in a further retreat of, of uh, democracy and democratic uh, principles or will this be an opportunity to revitalize those democratic institutions and, and democratic uh, principles and what can we all do to influence such, such developments. So I'd like to, without any further ado, uh, turn to our first uh, speaker. Uh, professor Sir Cheryl Saunders, you are Professor Emeritus even and Professorial Fellow at the University of Melbourne. You have more than 40 years experience as an academic and a practitioner with special interests and knowledge in comparative constitutional law. You have published numerous books and articles in these and related fields and you've also provided expert advice uh, to support constitutional processes across the world including in Myanmar, in the Philippines, in Syria, among many other countries. So I'd like to start with you. Uh, and ask you, what is your uh, take of the discussion so far comparing the three prominent uh, um, democracies and the foreign minister's uh, speech together with the Secretary General? And, and what would you like to add or where would you like to continue? Please, Professor Saunders. Well, thank you, Ambassador, and it's a great pleasure to be involved in this webinar. You know, unlike uh, Sweden and the Republic of Korea, Australia is a federation. Uh, and this means that democracy works at two levels of government, uh, each of which is accountable to its own parliament and its own group of citizens. And so assessing the democratic impact of the pandemic requires both those levels to be taken into account. Uh, in Australia, the public powers needed to respond to the pandemic are divided between the levels of government. Uh, for example, central powers include quarantine and external borders, uh, state or regional powers include hospitals, schools, uh, transport and so on. And each jurisdiction in Australia declared an emergency under legislation of its own, enacted in exercise of its own powers. Uh, and then the governments coordinated their efforts through a new institution, rather misleadingly called the National Cabinet, 
uh, comprising the heads of all government uh, who come from different sides of politics. Uh, the National Cabinet was advised by a body comprising chief health officers from each jurisdiction. Uh, it reached a common position on key matters, uh, but local difference between jurisdictions was accepted on other matters, uh, reflecting different situations around the country. So some states closed internal borders, while others didn't, uh, and restrictions were relaxed at different times in different places. Some tensions emerged between the levels of government, but no more than might have been expected in an exercise of this kind, and, and the, the tensions were quite quickly patched up. Uh, and at the height of the crisis, all leaders gave daily press conferences explaining quite clearly and straightforwardly what was being done. The emergency legislation conferred extensive power on ministers. Uh, parliaments at both levels of government were truncated, uh, both in respect of the number of mes members present and in the number and length of sittings. But some sittings did occur uh, to pass necessary enabling legislation. Uh, and some use also was made of parliamentary committees for the scrutiny of what the governments were doing. The courts continued, but without juries and with a lesser caseload conducting hearings online. So in the end, the Australian response to the health crisis was highly effective. Uh, its success depended significantly on public trust in what governments were doing. And despite uh, a relatively stringent lockdown, uh, there was significant voluntary compliance. Australian institutions were seen to be governing very effectively when an urgent need arose, and that's something on which I think we can build in the future. Uh, but for the future, the big issue will be winding back the concentration of executive power, uh, both within jurisdictions and between jurisdictions. Uh, the response to the pandemic has enabled uh, and encouraged this, and it will be an issue to watch very closely. So thank you. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, no, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Professor Saunders. And this was, of course, mentioned by Foreign Minister Payne uh, as well. It's, it's quite am amazing to, to see how this crisis then, in a sense, uh, developed uh, the Australian democracy or you found new ways of, how do you say, reinterpreting your constitutional um, arrangements in, in a way. And, and, and uh, I mean, you mentioned that there were some points of friction. You, you said uh, very different takes on when the restrictions would be eased, et, et cetera. And, and you also mentioned uh, rolling this back. I mean, if it was highly successful, will it be rolled back or will you maybe change, you know, the constitutional arrangements of, of the country? What, what do you predict? Well, I don't think it'll be a matter of changing constitutional arrangements. Uh, any federation has intergovernmental arrangements mm. and Australia has always had those. Uh, but the National Cabinet was a new institution, really just set up in the exercise of executive power that worked uh, in a rather more sort of uh, meeting of equals style than had been previously the case with intergovernmental arrangements. Mm -hmm. So there certainly is a proposal that the National Cabinet be continued. <laughs> the relevant question, I think, is whether it worked because of the crisis, because the crisis was so serious, uh, whether that culture can be continued on into less critical times is something uh, to watch. I very much hope that it can be, but uh, there's no guarantees. But I guess the key point is that the Australians found a way to collaborate uh, across uh, uh, borders or across constituencies that you hadn't done before in this uh, state of uh, emergency in, in, in a way, right? Well, and, and for, for the purposes of this webinar, it's not just that they were collaborating across borders, which of course is necessary, but that they were collaborating across political divides. Mm -hmm. I mean, that national cabinet brought together political leaders from very different sides of politics who in normal times uh, disagree on many things, but they completely subsumed political backbiting uh, for the period of the health crisis. And I think Australians responded to that and appreciated it. Uh, that's quite amazing. Maybe we'll come back to that. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Saunders, for those uh, initial uh, remarks. Uh, I'd like to turn to our next speaker, uh, Professor Sokyun Lee. You are with us here at the okay. Swedish residence in Seoul. I'm I'm grateful that you, you made it over here, despite it's actually 34 degree, degrees uh, outside, warm outside, and almost the same here, the inside of, of, of the residence. So, so, 
Professor Lee, you are a professor of the Graduate School of Governance at the Sung Kyung Kwan University, and you direct the Asia, East Asia Collaboration Center there. You have created the Asian Democracy Research Network in 2015, uh, where you're focusing on collaborative studies on Asian democracy. And I think your research interests include global governance, uh, democracy, NGOs, citizen participation, etc. You have also written numer numerous articles and, and books, uh, focusing, among other things, on populism in Asian democracies, transforming global governance in middle power diplomacy, public diplomacy and soft power in East Asia, etc., uh, etc. Et so, yeah, uh, we got some quite interesting insights from, from the foreign minister. It's true that you really have been applauded across the world for the, the conduct of the of uh, the fight against uh, the virus and uh, and the the uh, elections, which seems to have tomed in uh, or, or fallen in a very timely uh, period. So, so what are your uh, assessment of, of the reasons behind uh, this success? Maybe we heard some from the minister, foreign minister, but maybe you can develop this a little bit, please. Okay, Ambassador. So you are asking, what's the reason of a successful yeah. uh, election? It depends on the, what we mean by success. If we mean just the normal implementation of election, um, yes, it can be success. And also success means from the government perspective and ruling party, that's also success because they got the landslide victory in our general election. Um, so uh, let me uh, answer in this way uh, for the implementation itself. As our minister has talked already, uh, no Korean has ever doubted uh, because of this COVID-19, we may uh, delay our election, never, that kind of thought never occurred to us. Um, but uh, if, I, uh, am, if I identify several factors, I think uh, first of all, our election day was lucky because April 15 uh, is already, by the time we flattened the COVID-19 outbreak uh, from the late March. So from the April, people feel less threatened. So let's say if our election happened in March, because our peak was the early March, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe our voting rate uh, could have been decreased because our voting rate was 66%, uh, okay? So good timing because when we just or the, uh, the COVID-19 back. Second factor is the, our, you know, very good, the electoral system supporting um, the um, mass uh, participation. Uh, it's already discussed it because from the uh, 2014 local election, we introduced the early voting. So usually uh, for the, uh, the Friday, Saturday, uh, we allow the early voting, and uh, many salarymen can vote. Uh, so if you look at the compare the voting rate, uh, this time the early election voting rate was 27%. That was twice more than the previous general election. So you can see that kind of system has made more easier to vote, and also government was very clever uh, to persuade many voters to come out uh, with all this, you know, the, the guideline, wearing mask, and also uh, giving the plastic glove, and, and that kind of, uh, also, you know, uh, taking the physical distance. All these things were very clever. Uh, and third, if I'm saying, well, you know, by the time the world has praised how South Korea has done a very excellent job, so there was a kind of uh, increasing national pride so under this very good atmosphere, uh, I think people wanted to support the, the current incumbent government has done a good job. And also that has led to the landslide victory of ruling party taking 176 seats out of 300 uh, seats. Well, thank you very much. I mean, that's, that's fascinating. And I mean, leaving politics aside, I mean, the fact that you decided to introduce uh, early voting and staggered voting over a number of days uh, and postal voting, that of course means that you can vote uh, with more social distancing, uh, mm -hmm. purely, purely physically. 
Uh, now, one uh, question to you maybe, and that is about, I mean, this has been a, a whole of government and an all-out effort, is, uh, this uh, fight against the, the virus in Korea. I've seen it. I live here. But, but what about some of these, you know, necessary political reforms, et cetera, that had been in discussion, whether it's, you know, party laws on campaigning, accountability of, of unelected institutions, et cetera. Do you, do you fear that some of that might suffer in the sense that some of that might be delayed as a, as a result of this, with this kind of total focus on the fight against the, the virus? What do you think? Um, I guess the, the, our new national parliament is focusing on how to revive the economy and how to protect the people who are you know, damaged by the, this uh, situation. So they are all talking about the basic uh, the wages and how to support um, the less prejudiced class. So that will be the big uh, debate. Uh, however, I don't think uh, this COVID-19 situation will discourage politicians to discuss the political uh, reform law. I uh, saw the report from our parliament and they are uh, already, the research team has identified it, several laws to be uh, discussed in this coming um, the session. Well, thank you, Professor Lee. That sounds uh, encouraging. So I'd like to uh, continue and uh, uh, move to our next speaker today, who is joining us from, from Sweden, Mr. Stefan Lindberg. You are professor of political science at the University of Gothenburg, uh, my alma mater, by the way. Uh, you're also director and founding principal investigator of the VDEM Institute, which stands for Varieties of, of Democracy. You are a Wallenberg Academy Fellow, and you are also an author of, of many articles on issues such as uh, democracy, elections and democratization, accountability, women's participation and, and, and voting uh, behavior. And, and you also have quite an expense, extensive experience as a, a consultant and an advisor to international organization. And I know that behind you stand a whole, whole faculty of some, what is it, 15 researchers and, and so on. And uh, so I'd like to ask you, uh, Professor Lindberg, from rich, your rich ex experience, uh, what, what would you uh, like to add and where would you like to pick up here on the, uh, in the discussion? Maybe partly on the Swedish example, since that has kind of been in the focus, but also wider, because I know you have a truly global outlook as well. So, uh, Professor Lindberg, please. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, important seminar as part of the democracy talks that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden are, are running around the globe. Um, and, and I think I would like to uh, start with um, saying that I think that the discussion that's been had uh, about South Korea, Australia, and, and Sweden, three very strong democracies in the world, about the uh, potential effects on democracy domestically is important to be had. But I think democracies uh, like the three here and, and others who are, who are strong and, and, and uh, should we say consolidated democracies in the world need to look outward. I think the, uh, the ministers uh, alluded to that at least in some of their comments. So in our uh, democracy report that came out in March, which uh, then analyzes trends for democracy in the entire world up till the end of 2019, shows that not only have we, as the world, been in a, in a, in a democratic decline, and a wave of autocratization uh, for the past 10 years, but 2019 was a particularly bad year. It was the worst year in the last decade. And now autocracies, non-democracies, if you like, um, are in a majority in the world for the first time in a very long while. Um, and one third of the population in the world live in countries where democracy is in decline or has already failed. EU has its first non-democratic member, its first autocracy among its ranks, Hungary. So... 2019, at the end of 2019, and before we had COVID-19, the world was already in, the, in, a, in a bad situation getting worse when it comes to democracy. And 
<coughs> the 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 many restrictions on freedom of movement, freedom of assembly, in some countries, freedom of speech, the concentration of executive power, not only in Australia, where I don't think it's going to be a long-term problem, but in many other places it will be. Um, and COVID-19 is already being used by wannabe dictators uh, in many places in the world to further strengthen their rule and ensure their hold on power. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the the drive for democracy that Sweden has decided as a as a priority for foreign policy, I think, must be a priority for foreign policy uh, and international collaborations for all democracies in the world going forward. Professor Lindberg, thank you so very much, and reminding us of that more uh, global maybe duty, uh, even. And I, of course, uh, fully agree of the of the importance of. Of, of that. Uh, still, if I m just uh, may, I, I, I think, uh, as you rightly highlighted, the three democracies discussed today have obviously suffered under under this uh, under this uh, the management of, of the crisis. We've had to take extraordinary measures, and I think the eyes will be on on our uh, on on the three countries. How did these prominent and strong democracies actually uh, fare? And I think maybe some of the autoc autocracies are also maybe scrutinizing. Uh, extra and, uh, and I mean e even more than than otherwise and and if I m just may venture to ask uh, uh, one question which I, I know has come up uh, and that is you know in in Sweden the, the role of the expert has risen to an unprecedented uh, prominence uh, you know, with the, with the uh, public health official, the state uh, epidemiologist, etc., doing the uh, daily press briefings, whereas in many other countries it's maybe the president or the prime minister or a minister of public health, uh, etc. So, so uh, I'm, we will come back to the global issues, but if I may just ask your view, do you think that that in any way uh, could be seen as a, as, a, as a challenge in terms of accountability when we're talking about... Uh, you know, a crisis which is much wider than, than public health, etc., if it's seen from the outside? Uh, not necessarily. So, uh, as I think Foreign Minister Linda said, it builds on a very long tradition, several hundred years tradition in Sweden on how to organize the relationship between uh, the government and its ministries and the state authorities. So the state authorities have much more independence in Sweden. So the way it works in Sweden is the, the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> um, and and it's, it's, it's a slightly different sort of constitutional setup from, from most other countries. Uh, but we, 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 we have constitutional differences. I mean, we have a federal state here among us that work very different from a unitary state. The presidential and parliamentary have to deal with um, situations like this within the confines of, of their own configuration, so to speak. Um, the the um, in the end, the government is responsible in Sweden, um, just like in any country, uh, the other uh, country. Um, then, uh, in 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 our in our model, so to speak, uh, then in situations like this, the state authorities, um, uh, the relevant state authorities have a very important and a sort of executive role in many ways that goes beyond what, what other people are, or people from other countries are perhaps used to, but it, but it's, it's, it has not been, and it's, I don't see it as a, as a problem of democratic accountability um, uh, in, 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 in any serious way. Well, that's a really useful clarification. I, 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 as a Swede, I, I know, but I think for the benefit of the audience, that's uh, uh, quite interesting. So let me turn to our uh, final uh, speaker in the, in, the, in the panel, Ms. Lena Rikela Tamang. You are the director of the Asia and the Pacific Regional Program at International IDEA. You joined IDEA in 2002, and you've been working in India, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, among many countries. Among, among many countries. And uh, 
You've been teaching at the University, uh, University of Tampere in Finland, and you've also published, as the other distinguished panelists, about democracy at the global level, on women's political participation, on inclusive democratic processes, and you are also the former Secretary General of Finland's Advisory Board for Relations with the Developing Countries, and you're a member and a former chair of the Network Institute for Global uh, Democracy. Now, um, Lena, as a person uh, following this whole Asia and, and the Pacific region from, from IDEA and having listened to both the foreign ministers and the, 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 your colleagues and experts here, uh, what, what would you like to highlight from this uh, discussion, please? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. It's been really fascinating to listen to all speakers so far. Um, as a disclaimer, I should maybe mention I'm based in Canberra in Australia, where I, where I have spent these past few months, and originally I come from uh, Finland. I have three quick observations to make. And number one, in many ways, this pandemic has been a, an X-ray exposing strengths and weaknesses of institutions and societies. And the X-ray results of these three countries have been largely positive. All three are high-performing democracies with many strengths to draw from also in times of corona, even though uh, there are also issues to watch out for. Uh, speakers before me discussed the uh, role of institutions, some innovations, successful elections. So I go directly to aspects that we may need to worry about. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, many democracy indicators, as Stefan already mentioned, including the VDEM and also our global state of democracy in diocese, warned about trend of democratic declines of the last five, seven years, and also in established democracy. In Australia, we can detect slight decline on media integrity and free political parties since 2012. In Sweden, Social group equality, access to justice have been declining since 2012. Whereas Korea uh, has made steady progress on all major aspects over the last five years. However, the existing levels of free political parties, gender equality, independence of judiciary remain behind of many other high performing democracies. My second point, uh, I believe this pandemic is only going to accelerate ongoing global trends in good and in bad. And we are already seeing in very painful way how this pandemic is revealing deep-rooted inequalities in many societies. And we also know that after other pandemics, such as uh, both SARS and Zika, inequalities increased. Um, and other risks are enormous, uh, economic unrest, increased surveillance, increase in narrow nationalism, and, and so on. And my third point is that while this pandemic may well have been an X-ray of democratic institutions, it's also been a kind of a rusher test, you know, the psychological ink test uh, many of us gone through when applying for jobs. You kind of see what you want to see or what you have always seen. We have all read about the democratic uh, dystopias or fantasies. And while none of those may not realize as such, I believe we are at the crossroads. And at the same time, including a great opportunity at hand to learn from, from this crisis. And some of those learnings are very practical and relate to working institutions, organizing elections and so on. And some are probably more systemic related to very social contracts uh, we have had as societies, and those would require more deliberations and uh, reflections. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Uh, Tamang. I mean, it, what you say, some good forces are reinforced and some good trends, or some bad trends are also reinforced. May, could you maybe just expand a little bit on your last point there about the concrete institutional learnings? I mean, uh, maybe there are easy and, you know, good uh, takeaways that, that uh, you as idea, I mean, you of course have the benefit that you're, you know, by profession comparing many countries uh, or all countries essentially at the, at the same time. So what, what are the kind of good practices or 
good examples you'd like to highlight, if you would. Yeah, thank you. I think, first of all, I, I think I should mention, I should say that I think learnings from previous crises were in fact applied. Uh, Australia had the preceding bushfire emergency, so a kind of crisis awareness by the leadership was there, and I think that paved the way to many good decisions. And similarly, Korea was applying lessons learned from the SARS epidemic and understanding early on the importance of shift action and so on. But in terms of practical democracy-related uh, learning, I think we have seen a lot of innovations. Uh, parliaments discovered they, there are alternative ways of working, uh, including remote voting, remote uh, committee work. Uh, I'm confident that many of the special voting arrangements, including absentee voting, early voting, postal voting, e-voting, e will all get more prominence after this, after this crisis. Uh, both Minister Payne, Professor Saunders mentioned the example of national cabinet in, in coordinating decision making in, in the federal setup. And we have witnessed the comeback of experts um, in uh, based and the kind of evidence based uh, decision making. And I hope that that practice is here to stay. And I think courts need to think through how to ensure access to justice. Even, even at times of lockdown. Um, and many nations, I believe, are now examining some of the constitutional and legal frameworks, kind of see if, whether those can truly pass the sort of stress test or, or if amendments are needed. And I think in many ways it is, you're know, looking at sort of uh, back to basics uh, strategies and uh, acknowledging that institutions matter. Well, thanks a lot. And I, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, uh, you're actually planning to, to assemble some of the conclusions from this uh, seminar uh, today. And you've already got a good list uh, there in, in your uh, writings. It was actually, by the way, a, a, an idea brief uh, on the elections here in, in, in Korea, which uh, you know, prompted this whole seminar from the very beginning. So I can only recommend reading of, of your, your papers. Now, I'd like to... Um, in a moment, we will turn, uh, you know, open up to the to the audience and and also to the online uh, followers uh, here. But I'd like to uh, drill into to one question. It was uh, touched only slightly uh, before, and and this is the issues where the um, necessities of fighting the pandemic and the quite intrusive sometimes uh, legislation on rules or restrictions are colliding with issues of individual privacy or or integrity and and for that matter the right of, of assembly and we we actually spoke before this uh, seminar about the the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstration that has happened in many countries over the, the last weekend. So I'd like to hear just yet very quickly from each of you four in the, in the panel, and I'll, I'll start with Professor Saunders and continue with Professor Lee and then Professor Lindbergh and then uh, Ms. Rikala Tamang. So uh, get your, your snapshot thoughts about that uh, tension and how to deal with it. So. Professor Saunders, what do you think about that? How should we... Yes, well, you're, you're quite right, of course. There is a tension between uh, uh, protecting people's health in these circumstances and rights of all kinds, so rights to freedom of movement, for example, in the Australian context. And in Australia, that particular trade-off was accepted, I think, uh, without too much um, quibble because people put such a deal of faith in the way the system was, was handling the crisis. Um, but as we said uh, earlier today, uh, the real uh, conflict came just quite recently uh, during the uh, Black Lives Matter um, um, demonstrations that took place right across Australia, capital cities, regional cities, uh, hundreds of thousands of people marching. Uh, I mean, the actual uh, size of gatherings varies a bit uh, between states around Australia, but on no view did they do they encompass 100,000 people uh, in the CBD. And so there was a real question, uh, not only for people about whether they would go out and march, and clearly in a way that was contrary uh, to the health requirements, but uh, a real question for governments, you know, how far hard would they clamp down on this? Uh, uh, 
would they let it go ahead? And if they did, would that uh, complicate the uh, health protections going forward? Uh, so I think the Australian experience on that deserves some, some further study to see how democratic governments reacted to that. By and large, I think it wasn't too bad. Well, thank you. I mean, if it happens once and uh, during a brief period of time, I, I guess the, you can find a way. But if this is going to be there for the long haul and it actually challenges rights, that might... Professor Lee, I mean, in, in, in Korea, you haven't had such big uh, demonstrations, but there's been this discussion about individuals' integrity with, you know, camera, surveillance cameras and mobile phone uh, mapping of people's, uh, you know, movements, etc. So what's your take on this? We have a problem with the microphone. No, it's better. Uh, so voice. Yes. please start again. Yeah, um, I guess uh, in this fighting against COVID-19, every country is struggling with this uh, dilemma between the protection of individual privacy and also some, you know, government uh, gathering of information to uh, share the information with the other public. So. That aspect is all shared. Our case is a little bit, some people worry because uh, we had uh, the Mars after 2003 SARS, and then in 2000, uh, 2015, we have uh, MERS. And after experiencing MERS, uh, our uh, government consolidated uh, this uh, center so they can all collect the data, not just the GPS, and also credit card and all this uh, people's movement data. Um, so therefore, um, yes, it can be very uh, efficient, effective, but at the same time, it can infiltrate it into a privacy space. And of course, after this one became an issue, uh, in the, uh, the contact tracing map, the government erased the information of tracing after 14 days. So there is a kind of, uh, they kind of respond to this worry. And also during this fight against COVID-19, we had a kind of minority issues, like uh, in Tegu, the epicenter of Korea's uh, COVID-19, uh, the majority of the infected cases were uh, belonging to this exclusive Christian group called the Shincheonji. So there was a very much public, um, uh, the criticism against, against this sect. And also, uh, after the, the May outbreak in Itaewon, um, you know, the, there is uh, also very uh, antagonistic feelings uh, rebuilt against the gay minority in Korea. So all these issues, uh, you know, uh, remind that the Korean public, you know, uh, we have to be very careful about the, their uh, religious right, even their minority, and also the, this uh, sexual minority as well. No, no, I agree with you, especially the issues of uh, scapegoating or, I mean, stigmatizing uh, my minorities. I, I, I really see that. Professor Lindbergh, I mean, this brings us to the global issues immediately because this is a, a key issue, which I guess is a, a huge challenge in, in, in every country. What, what does your research uh, tell us about uh, these tensions and how that is dealt with in different democracies and not so democratic countries, maybe? Yeah, the tension between civil liberties and fundamental democratic and human rights, in fact, uh, and strategies to fight uh, a pandemic is obviously at the heart here. And the key principle that's internationally agreed is that it has to be proportional. There's been very little discussion about that proportionality, I would say, in, 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 even in most democracies. And that worries me a lot. People got afraid, that fear was whipped out by governments themselves and by the media. And then suddenly people across the world almost sort of accepted extreme re restrictions on fundamental human rights without que questioning it and without questioning the pro proportionality. And, and that worries me for the future. What about the next crisis and what governments will use what type of situation claim it's a crisis and further derail human rights and democratic rights. 
and use further surveillance mechanisms to limit our freedoms. And, and to my South Korean uh, uh, colleague and friend here, I would say, well, they said they erased it. How do you know? Right? We will never know if the governments uh, actually erase those traces and the tech companies they use that they work with that typically preserve the right to sell that kind of information. So this is, I, I, I'm, I'm very worried that uh, this is setting a precedent that can be used to derail democratic rights and human rights in the future. Well, that brought us to a much bigger issue. I mean, you said you talked about proportionality, but uh, essentially we're into to what extent uh, democracy as such is, is backsliding as, as a result of, a, of a, an in incre incremental increase in, in, in uh, this type of, of measures. But I guess it's also up to, to each country and uh, political tradition how you deal with that and the level of, uh, of acceptance. Uh, Ms. Rikala Tamang, what, what, do, what do you make of this? I mean, you, as you watch uh, the region here, uh, uh, and, and when you see this tension being handled in different ways, uh, privacy against necessary and legitimate actions by, by governments, do you, do you think it's a long-term threat to democracy? Um, yes, I do believe it is. It is it's a real risk as this in, increased surveillance relates to intrusion of privacy relates to the question of what type of data and how much of private information we want to submit out there. Uh, maybe downloading the COVID-19 tracking app, it is a trade-off uh, between public health and our private information. The question is, what is the, what is the acceptable trade-off? Uh, it seems, yes, both in Korea and in, in Australia so far, uh, this app has been received, uh, well received. And of course, the underlying worry is uh, whether the data is used toward our best interest and whether we know for sure uh, that is the case. Um, I think in a democracy, um, what justification for obtaining uh, any data should always be there. There needs to be justification um, demonstrating security, justification for accountability, that decision making is uh, robust and that the, the whole system is open to some sort of independent uh, review. But it's also true, of course, that societies may value um, privacy somewhat differently. It is, uh, it is also uh, contextual. But I think I, I do agree with, uh, with Stefan that this is something we really need to keep a close eye on uh, as as we move forward and the next uh, crisis to come along, these sort of mechanisms do easily get normalized. All of a sudden, it is, it is perfectly normal to submit all this data and all this information, which just a couple of years, um, months ago, was, was not something that we were ready to, to do. Oh, it's quite amazing how the acceptance, acceptance for some, some measures has really you know, changed so quickly and so dramatically. Uh, well, thank you for your comments. I, I, we have about uh, a bit less than 20 minutes uh, to go, so I'd really like to, to open up to the, both to the, our live audience here at, uh, at, the, at the residence, and then I know that the questions are ticking in uh, on, online. Uh, so, uh, is there anyone here at the, at the residence who would like to put a question? So, please, and why don't you just also introduce yourself and, and put your question. And then we'll see. If you know who to direct these to in the panel, just say. Otherwise, I'll ask. <laughs> uh, my name is BJ Kim. I teach at the Korea Development Institute School of Public Policy. Uh, I was very glad to see overall discussion towards the uh, later part going into the issues of human rights and privacy because fundamentally speaking, I think what we are trying to discuss here is liberal democracy. Many of our speakers have spoken that democracy has been in decline, but if you be precise about it, that's not exactly true. If we, com if we define democracy as a simple majoritarian rule, in fact, democracy is doing great because simple majoritarian rule could lead our democracies to populism. And populism is doing great in so many different countries around the world. So fundamentally speaking, it's not the simple majoritarian rule that we are talking about here. Rather, what we are talking about is 
the combination of two very important values, that is uh, liberalism as a respect for human rights of the individuals and individual freedom on one hand, and then democracy as a collective choice altogether. So in that regard, I think Korea has been do doing great on the second part of it uh, ever since the uh, end of 1980s. And we have achieved considerable progress, considerable progress on the first part, the, the, the liberalism as well. In fact, in my own belief, Korea has been doing a really good job within the region of Asia. I think within the Asian region, Korea may be a leader in terms of uh, producing progress in strengthening uh, liberalism. But still, I think we have a uh, you know, long way to go in comparison with our perhaps friends in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, when I saw different aspects of uh, coronavirus uh, crisis here in Korea, as Professor Lee mentioned, in the cases of religious minority case, and also LGBT community relating to the part of town here called Itaewon here, I was nervous because I was seeing Korean success being produced up to that point as a part of aspect of collective action, the community acting together to deal with the crisis. Which is, uh, which is something that Korea is well known for, very uh, good at. But when we saw the issues of uh, minorities, religious minority, and also LGBT community, I was quite nervous. I don't think we actually went off the cliff. I think we stopped at the right point and we didn't go too far. So indeed, I think we succeeded in managing those very uh, delicate points. So I was happy to see that. But however, at the end of May, just one week left before actual implementation. Ministry of Justice announced their decision to require all foreigners here, residents and immigrants, non-citizens, foreigners who have lived here for 30, 40 years to receive re-entry permit when they leave this country. And this was the Ministry of Justice, not Ministry of Health. Ministry of Justice that was going to make a decision about whether this particular person who spent several decades in this country could come back to their families or not. And I was abhorred by this decision and I was angered with my uh, foreign friends here as well who spent four or five decades here in this country, who love this country altogether. And so when, when I saw that aspect, I saw the vulnerability uh, the, the fragility of this nation in terms of in its efforts to respect human rights, individual freedom, and so on within the global scale, even though we have come a long way so far. But good news is, to conclude my remark, uh, so I think there was one case where we realized that Korea has a long way to go on that front. But good news is that since then, uh, the implementation date was June 1st. But since then, in the face of m much criticism, I think the Ministry of Justice has taken its steps back, creating a lot of different kind of exceptions and so on. So I think the, the, that decision has become almost uh, meaningless by now, which is a good thing. So that was a positive uh, wrap up, I guess, I'd like to share about the story that highlighted the fact that this country still has a long way to go on the liberalism side of this important value, liberal democracy. Well, I guess uh, the capacity and the capability to change uh, decision is, a, is, a, is a something that is typical for, for democracies. I, I don't know if there is someone in the panel who would like to comment on this. Uh, Professor Lee, you know the, the uh, Korean uh, circumstances maybe most in detail, or I don't know if Professor Saunders or Professor Lindbergh would, would like to say something about uh, this uh, particular example or what it represents. Who would like? Yeah, Professor Lee, just please. Say, if I may, I think uh, compared to the national citizens uh, in this uh, the COVID-19 situation, one of the most vulnerable people are migrant workers and uh, temporary stay foreign uh, nationals and also illegal workers uh, because they are not documented. Uh, so uh, they are sort of in limbo. Okay, so uh, in that aspect, South Korea is n no exception uh, in uh, failing uh, in, a, in taking good care of these uh, uh, migrant workers and uh, uh, the 
non documented foreign workers here. Maybe we should move on unless anyone else in the panel would like to Thanks. comment on that. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah, please, sir. And please introduce yourself as well. All right. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is uh, Jason Lee. I'm a professor and drama chair at Korea University. And first of all, thank you very much for your uh, very insightful comments. And today we are talking about democracy in the times of Corona. But, act, but actually, we also we should be ready for the democracy in the aftermath of Corona. And during past few weeks and a few months, uh, we have seen a quite a universal phenomena of the return of big state with a very strong quarantine control. And actually, the, the, the huge temptation for the, uh, the, the, uh, the ultimate uh, unlimited budget spending, the physical spending. So the, the government is getting bigger. And at the same time, uh, the protectionism, nationalism are growing, and uh, that is actually feeding the populist and extreme, the uh, extreme side, uh, actually the, the both extreme side. So the, now the, nowadays, the uh, democracy is facing a big challenge in, the, in times of Corona. Then, then uh, we, have, we may have two choices. The one is in the aftermath of Corona, one option is going back to pre-corona era and be well, and and have to emphasize the uh, liberalism and and personal individual freedom just as before. Or do we have to be ready for a new types of democracy and do we have to accept a new reality and we may not be able to go back to the other pre-corona years? So. What would be the likely the uh, the path we would take, and, and I'm, I am raising uh, this question to any of the panels. Who, I think that's a fascinating yeah. uh, question. Is the is democracy democracy going to be fatally fatally wounded by the Corona crisis or or not? Professor Lindbergh seems eager to to take on that one. So why don't you start? Yeah, I think it's an important point to look forward, and uh, we then note that already before Corona, we had a wave across the world that's associated with this backsliding of democracy, that different forms of, should I say, ugly nationalism uh, and, and polarization of society, whether it's sort of a, a Muslim nationalism in Turkey or a Hindu nationalism in India or a Christian uh, strange kind of nationalism behind Trump or Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, and so on. And of course, in Hungary uh, as well. And that has been uh, uh, emphasizing a very reactionary view on society and leading to a, 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 an increase in polarization, a toxic polarization of societies. And I think the corona pandemic has the potential also long term to feed into this and further strengthening it. So that's another aspect. I, I'm grateful my colleague from Korea University brought it up. That's another aspect we need to keep track of and counteract as democracies in the world. Thank you, Professor Lindbergh. I think that Ms. Rikila Tamang wanted to come in on that one as well, so please. Yeah, no. Thank you for thank you for that question. Um, and I think in the post-Corona time, what is definitely needed and already should start now are the are the public debate, uh, the public scrutiny, but also debate and discussions at all levels of society. Um, people will remember uh, what it, what is the story that we are going to tell about this time. It is. Is it the war to be won, uh, or is it the sickness to recover from, or is this even a moment of, of some great transformation as the head of IMF for people has suggested? Has suggested? Uh, will people remember that they were looked after or left alone? Uh, were people treated equally, or were some people more privileged than, than others? 
And I think those are going to be some of the critical questions to the uh, post-corona debate. And we've certainly seen examples of where the social contract uh, is being broken. We have seen the plight of migrant workers walking thousands of kilometers in, in many South Asian countries back to their villages. And we have witnessed and perhaps we participated in some of the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, recognizing that the social contract uh, there was broken as well, that we are suffering from systemic racism in, in, many, of our, uh, in many of our societies. Um, surprisingly, on what it comes to populism and populist leaders, in, the, in many places, the kind of airtime of the populist leaders seem to be, they, they haven't been able to, to get that. Uh, I just noticed that at least in Sweden, the, it is the Social Democratic Party had a highest ever support in the polls. Uh, same, uh, same happened in Finland. And these were both are countries where the sort of right-wing populist leaders have been lurking uh, in the sidelines. So much depends, for sure, how, this, how the post-corona time is going to be managed, how the economic recovery is to be managed, uh, and what uh, what is the what is the, the the kind of a feeling that many citizens will uh, will have after the after the pandemic? Thank you so much uh, for that uh, reply. Uh, we still have uh, some five ten minutes uh, to go, and I really would like to honor my my. Uh, promise from the beginning and that is to turn to all of those uh, all of you who are following us on online and as I said we've received quite a few questions so here's one which I think is quite pertinent it comes from Indonesia where the simple question is during a pandemic how is it possible to go ahead with elections isn't it better to let the fo uh, government focus on combating corona combating corona rather than to risk an increase spread by the virus so what is the panel's advice to this? Who would like to start? Well, I can start. Um, Mr. Professor I think Lindbergh. it's contextual. Yes. Uh, it, it has to be judged from country to country. So in, in South Korea, uh, we saw a very successful conduct, uh, conduct of elections. Uh, elections were uh, postponed in Poland, uh, I think, for good reasons. Uh, going ahead with the elections would have been a mistake there. It depends on where you are in the pandemic cycle. It depends on what uh, technologies you can offer uh, in a safe way uh, to, to guarantee the integrity of the vote. Um, it's clear that um, cancelling or postponing elections uh, already have been used uh, to uh, further sort of insulate uh, incumbents from challengers. Uh, but uh, elections should not go ahead in any kind of circumstances. So I don't think there's one uh, answer that fits every situation. Thank you, Professor Lindbergh. Anyone else who would like to? Professor Lee, please. I guess uh, it depends on country. I agree. Um, the Indonesia is a huge country divided by so many islands. So even under the no COVID-19 situation, it took so many days, weeks to collect and to implement election and, and to collect the uh, votes. So it's quite understandable. Uh, however, if you are properly um, guide yourself, maybe with mask and all kinds of things, if it's technological innovation uh, can be done that are fascinating. So with uh, all due uh, efforts, I think it's much better not to postpone election. And for the previous question by uh, my fellow uh, uh, Professor uh, Lee, I guess um, we have to distinguish between populism and also the, the uh, post-COVID-19 economic recovery. All responsible countries are preparing right, uh, to, uh, to pour the money uh, from their concern was helping people out of work. Now they are moving to pouring money to create demand to normalize the economy. So I don't think it's a populism. So it, is, it depends on how much the government can absorb, right? If it's Italy, Italy's debt 
is already so huge, right? But South Korea, we are like a low 40s. Our politicians and public opinions are divided over these issues because we have been running very our finance in a conservative way, so people worry about the rapid speed of uh, in increasing our debt ratio. Uh, but at the same time, there must be a kind of wise cap uh, we can expand to create the demand. At the same time, we have to be very careful to spend the money, allocate the money to the necessary uh, area, uh, to the, really uh, the, the people who uh, need that kind of assistance rather than just you know, giving all the money to everyone. Yep. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. I, I have another question. This one is from Iran. How can we face authoritarian regimes that hide the truth about COVID-19 and its impact? Under democratic systems, it's easy to follow up, but in certain countries without democracy, people suffer from the lack of transparency. How should we respond to them? So who would like to take on that one? Yeah, so uh, well, uh, Professor Limberg. Uh, yeah, since uh, nobody else says anything. Uh, I mean, this is a general problem with authoritarian regimes. Uh, they can hide and cheat with numbers much more than democracies can, although it's not uh, impossible for democracies to do. Uh, and this regards COVID-19 and it regards GD GDP per capita growth. I mean, everything. Um, so... Uh, uh, the 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 I, I guess the only thing uh, democracies in the world can do is is keep on uh, pounding them as much as you can uh, in terms of being honest and and uh, uh, and uh, uh, behave better. But uh, I'm not sure that's going to make much of a difference. Thank you, Professor Limbay. I saw that Ms. Rikula Talang wanted Maybe. to respond to this as well, please. Yeah, simply to add what uh, what Stefan said, uh, as with any any other any authoritarian regimes, you can try find the ways to support uh, media inside the country. You can try to support regional actors, regional media to try to investigate. You can support local, national civil society actors, uh, academia, independent researchers uh, in, in, uh, in do, trying to uh, produce a bit more uh, objective uh, information and uh, get that information uh, out there. Otherwise, it is the, what you would try to do otherwise, either through calling out uh, such bad practices or through, through the kind of uh, different strategies of nudging, trying to find the entry points wherever you can, uh, maybe sometimes through regional uh, cooperation, collaboration, you make do some headways. But uh, and I think the, the support to media organizations, regional media, uh, academia, uh, to support the, the counterparts in those countries would be perhaps the one possible way. To, to get more information out. Thank you so much. Time is, yeah, um, Professor Saunders, please. Yeah, I was just going to add to that. I don't uh, uh, disagree with anything that uh, has been said, but um, I mean, the, the odd thing about this pandemic is it's the one thing that an authoritarian government can't cover up terribly well. I mean, they can cover <laughs> up the numbers, but the fact that there is a big problem uh, is evident to everybody and ought to be uh, a reality that puts some pressure uh, on the regime because as people sort of struggle to get through life. Thank you so much. I, I think we're already a little bit in overtime, so I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, just the last question, uh, and I would like to take this one because I think it provides a little bit of a positive spin. It's a question that we've received from Sweden. So, in what way can we take advantage of the pandemic to strengthen the, the democracy in the world? So, I'd like to have uh, some quick responses from each of the panelists. Uh, your best tips for strengthening democracy in the midst of this pandemic. So, Professor Saunders, are you ready to start? Yes, I am. Uh, 
Professor Lindbergh said a couple of questions ago that uh, he was sketching the trajectory of democracy in the world and saying that uh, countries like the ones we're talking about here are not really the major problem, that there is uh, backsliding uh, in a very serious way elsewhere. Of course, that's true. Uh, but countries that pride themselves on being democratic role models actually should be democratic role models. And the reality is, as he was saying, uh, they have been sliding too. Uh, so I think that uh, those of us who are in that fairly fortunate position should seize the moment of the pandemic, not just slide into the future, uh, but use it uh, not just to wind back the COVID-19 measures, uh, but to think very hard about the other ways in which our democracy was not performing. Uh, and to use the chance where we have it uh, of institutions having uh, regained public trust uh, to build on that, to build what Lena described as a, uh, as a new social contract. And I think we need to do that very deliberately, not just to let it all happen. New social contract from Professor Saunders. So Professor Lee, what's your, what's your tip? I guess uh, we can get some good point from the COVID-19 upon democracy is that this pandemic, I guess every pandemic puts the uh, politically and economically weak populations into very, very difficult situation. They are most vulnerable people, right? And through that uh, awareness, I think we can be, again, look at the situation uh, like in the USA, uh, with this pandemic hitting um, the, the African-American, it's not just the police brutality. There is, uh, you know, as you know, the African-American takes about only 14% of the American population, but they are taking 40% of, you know, people who are dead of COVID-19. So uh, that rekindled racial issue again and then the, the, the world is supporting this Black Lives Matter uh, protest movement. Uh, likewise in Korea too, after this Itaewon, the, uh, the, the gay community, uh, uh, the, the infection cases, I think there are more voices from the, the minority groups to demand the, the right of this uh, uh, the minority group. So I think there are chance we are, uh, you know, become more conscious about the, the very shade, shady issues the society hasn't talked in public. So we can make this into a you know, more mm. positive way. That's great if it uh, ends up uh, support, uh, you know, creating more, giving more support or for, for the victimized groups. Uh, Professor Lindbergh, what's your tip? Yes, so let me pick it up from there. Um, first, let me apologize. I'm gonna give you my 30 seconds take on this and then I have to leave this because I'm, I have to give a talk in another webinar. Sure, we in, are in wrapping up very soon. Yeah, so um, I think 2019 was not only uh, back, uh, uh, the year of backsliding for democracy, but it was also the year of protest. 44% of countries in the world had pro-democratic protests in 2019. It wasn't only Hong Kong and Sudan. It was very widespread. And I think the hope is that that pro-democratic wave of pro-democratic mobilization bounces back once the uh, worst phase of the pandemic is over. Let's hope for that. Perfect. And on that, let me say. Sure. See you. <laughs> Let's continue the discussion. Ms. Rika Latlang, what's your, Tamang, what's your, what's your tip or what's your recommendation? Well, my tip is uh, bring back the experts to support uh, decision making, political decision making, and uh, not only epidemiologists but uh, also sociologists psychologists, educators, and I have to say democracy experts too. Um, many of us want to make sure democracies come out of this crisis stronger, not weaker. Uh, and there is much the democracy experts and organizations can, can advise leaders about. Uh, and at the same time, obviously, uh, it is the political leaders who need to bear the responsibility and uh, the ones who have the accountability. Thank you. Thank you so much. And 
Actually, you all disappeared here on, on the screen when Professor Lindbergh uh, left the, the meeting, which means that it's time to, to wrap up. And, and time really did fly. I think we had a fascinating discussion this afternoon. And this, uh, this expert panel, I really like to, to thank you for your contribution. I think contributions, I think it was both broad and, and, and very rich. We learned about challenges, and they are indeed many. But, but there, are, there is also hope, as, as we saw at, at the end here. And, and um, you know, the con conversation continues. And, uh, but before we, we wrap up, I'd really also like, apart from you, uh, the foreign ministers, the secretary general of I, IDEA, and you, panel, panelists here, I'd really like to, to thank everybody who made this, uh, this event uh, possible. And I'm, I'm thinking of the, the great uh, contacts that we have had with the foreign ministries in, in Canberra, in Seoul, in, in Stockholm to make this, uh, to make this possible. Uh, the great collaboration with uh, International IDEA, uh, uh, who is our co-host and co-sponsor and our best friends in, in making this uh, this uh, all, all, all possible. And, and last but not least, I'd really like to, to thank the colleagues here at the embassy in, in Seoul and the whole production team that made, it, made, made this possible. It's been led very, very uh, competently by Ms. Victoria Rodin uh, Sandstrom. And I really, I really thank you all for, for making this possible. Thank you so much. And with this, I think we should uh, wrap up and close this meeting. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.